Well, you guys are stuck with me tonight. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I, I do have a, a short message to share tonight. Part, yes, thank you. Well, here's the reason why. As Pastor Jeff met his quota, went over his quota this morning, and he dug into my time tonight. So I've, I've only, I'm on a limited time tonight, Pastor Jeff, thanks to you. So... No, in all seriousness, um, I want to bring a few thoughts to you tonight, a few perspectives, and uh, we're going to close in a time of worship and prayer, and then we'll be done. So um, I promise I'll, I do have something to share with you. So when you hear a preacher say that, you're thinking, oh great, he didn't prepare anything. So I did prepare, but um, I just want to let you guys know that. Um, man, it's Christmas time. Anybody excited? It's exciting? Yes. Um, I love Christmas time. It's, it's just that season, that season of anticipation, excitement that's in the air. Um, I love spending time with my family. Um, even it feels like it begins at Thanksgiving weekend. I don't know if anybody else feels like that, but it feels like Thanksgiving weekend. It's here. We're with family, kind of in that zone of spending even more time with your family, um, eating lots of food, watching football, sleeping in, all that kind of stuff. It's it's fun. Uh, I love seeing the excitement on my kids' faces. I love um, toying with them. I'm like, maybe I'll tell them what they're getting for Christmas, and then I really don't. That type of thing. That's always fun. Um, I, I enjoy looking at Christmas lights. Anybody else like driving around? You see Christmas lights? Yeah, that's fun. Um, I, I'm torn when I go down the streets because I, I have this weird um, thing that I enjoy straight Christmas lights. Anybody else like me? Like, no offense if, if houses are not straight, but it's just me, and if it's not straight, it bugs me. And it bugs me, and so if you drive by my house, and if it's Christmas light isn't straight, please tell me, because I'll get up in the snow and fix that thing. So um, speaking of that, I'm a fair weather Christmas light hanger. Um, only if it's nice and warm out do I go out. I'm not this rugged, it's, you know, 35 below, and blowing wind, go hang my Christmas lights. So remember a couple weeks ago on Thursday when it was 75 degrees out, and Friday was supposed to be 35, I'm like, that's my day. So I picked out my day, I hung my Christmas lights, and they'll be up probably till May when it's warm again, <laughs> and then I'll tear them down. So last year, no joke, I'm up on my roof taking down my Christmas lights, and some guy walks by, he's like, you know what, you're close enough to Christmas, might as well leave them up. <laughs> so... And honestly, I contemplating it, I'm like, it might be worth it, actually. So, um, anyways, Black Friday shopping. Anybody get out and do some shopping? You know, Thursday night type of shopping. Um, I know it's Thanksgiving on that day, and, and some people don't want to go out shopping, but I'd much rather stay up a little bit later than get up early. I'm more of a night owl. So, um, my wife and I went out with my sister and, and her husband, Matt, um, on Thanksgiving night, we did some, you know, evening shopping type of thing, and um, it, half of the fun is just people watching. Anybody else like that? I mean, it's just fun. There's some crazy people out there, you know. There's some really crazy people out there, and people are like, they're adamant. They're going to do all this kind of stuff, and they're running through the stores and, and um, buying all the stuff that they weren't planning on buying, all that kind of stuff. And we're, we're in line. My brother-in-law were in line while our wives were still looking at a few more things, and um, we got a kick out of this lady that um, she was in front of us, and she must have found a good deal on pillows. Um, she had like two packs of two pillows, so there's four pillows total, and she had a big like crock pot in a box, um, and she was staying in line for a really long time, so she obviously got tired, so she tied with her scarf um, all of the pillows and the packages together, and she's dragging the pillows. No joke, she's dragging the pillows and kicking the box as she like moves along in the line, and there was one point, uh, this, is, this made the, w wor the, the weight worth it, because she like... At one point, she was laying back on the pillows, like spread out on the floor, like she was so tired. And then another time, um, she's on her knees, leaning over onto the pillows, like thinking, this is an exhausting time for you, uh, type of thing. So it, it, it's a funny time. So um, anyways, Christmas is fun. It's a fun time of the year. And obviously, the true meaning of Christmas is the birth of Jesus, our Savior. 
And uh, I'm going to encourage you to take this time, this month, to dig deeper into the story of Christmas and the, the true meaning of it, of why we celebrate, um, and to, to remind ourselves of that. Obviously, 2,000 years ago, um, a baby was born, and this was not a surprise baby by all means. This had been anticipated, and that's part of the excitement of this time of year. And I was talking to my kids the other day, thinking, can you imagine waiting hundreds of years you know, for a Messiah, hundreds of years for your, your king to come. And um, we have a tough time waiting from Thanksgiving to Christmas, you know, to open up a present. And they waited hundreds of years for this. And so it was a very exciting time. Um, a few of the, the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, um, especially through his birth, stand out to me. There's multiple ones. Many times in the Old Testament, is, he was prophesied about this. Um, a couple of them, ones that I I want to remind us of before we set the stage for tonight. One, that he was an heir to the throne of David. Um, if, you, if you read in Matthew chapter 1, um, that goes through the lineage. It's a really cool thing. Um, 700 years before that, that was prophesied. It was a cool thing. Um, the place of birth, about 750 years before Jesus was born, it was prophesied in Micah that he would be born in the town of Bethlehem. How cool is that? I mean, none of us can do that this day where we would anticipate, hey, the future president of the United States is going to be born in, you know, Centerville, Iowa in 500 years from now or whatever. You just can't do that. And that's a really cool thing. And obviously one of the most amazing stories is that Jesus would be born of a virgin, not only the Son of God, but be born of a virgin. And uh, that's an amazing thing. Some, again, some 700 years before Jesus was born, um, fulfilled that he's fully human, fully God, sinless from birth. An amazing story. This, this story, you know, is very crucial to our faith. And that's very important. So that's why I encourage you to dig deep. Uh, so tonight, we're beginning a, a series titled The Character of Christmas. Um, we're going to look at three of the main characters of the story of Christmas, so the birth of Jesus. Um, tonight, I'm going to be sharing about Joseph. Next Sunday night, Pastor Luke will share. And then in uh, three weeks, Pastor Jeff will be finishing it off. In between there, we have our Christmas musical. Um, but I, I, like I said, I encourage you, find a good commentary, find a good devotional book that can go along with your Bible. Make this season more than just business as usual, just going through the motions of worrying about the presents and, and hosting families and that kind of stuff. Um, do all that, and that's okay, but I mean, open up your Bible and dig deep into the, into the scriptures. So um, our perspective for th this small series on Sunday nights is simply this, is we're going to pull out um, three of the people from the story and look at their character, who they were, um, what th their character w shone and shined during the story, um, and that's kind of part of what makes the story so great. And so we're going to look at those um, for that. Uh, I, I do have a book, Max Lucado. Um, Lucado Okada, what is it? Locato. Okay, so I said it right. Um, he has this book called Cast of Characters, and he just kind of um, takes some uncommon people that the Bible talks about and just um, um, looks into their life a little bit. So this is talking about Joseph. Uh, the white space between Bible verses is fertile soil for questions. One can hardly read scripture without whispering, I wonder. I wonder if Eve ever ate any more fruits. I wonder if Noah slept well during storms. I wonder if Jonah liked fish or if Jeremiah had friends. Did Moses avoid bushes? Did Jesus tell jokes? Did Peter ever try water walking again? Uh, would any woman have married Paul had he asked? The Bible is a, a fence full of knot holes through which we can peek but not see the whole picture. It's a scrapbook of snapshots capturing people in encounters with God, but not always recording the result. A cast of characters in a drama of cosmic importance, but without um, um, very much to go off of. So we wonder, when the woman caught in adultery went home, what did she say to her husband? After, after the demoniac was delivered, what did he do for a living? After Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead, did she ever regret it? Not holes and snapshots and I wonders. You'll find them in every chapter about every person. But nothing stirs so many questions as does the birth of Jesus Christ. Characters appear and disappear before we can ask them anything. The innkeeper, was he too busy, obviously being wel too busy to welcome God? Did he ever learn who he turned away? The shepherds, did they ever hum the song that the angels sang? The wise men who followed the star 
Um, what was it like to worship a toddler? And Joseph, especially Joseph, I've got questions for Joseph. Did you and Jesus arm wrestle? Did you ever let him win? Did you ever look up from your prayers and see Jesus listening? How do you say Jesus in Egyptian? Whatever happened to the wise men, whatever happened to you? We don't know what happened to Joseph. His role in act one is so crucial that we expect to see him the rest of the drama, but with the exception of a short scene with the 12 year old Jesus in Jerusalem, he never reappears. And with that, I wanna look into the story of Joseph from Matthew chapter one. Hopefully, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. We'll be getting there in just a moment. Matthew chapter one, verse 18. Joseph, obviously, like I said, he was um, in the, the lineage of Abraham, David, Solomon, and many more. You can read about that in Matthew chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 1. He was the earthly father of Jesus, basically an ordinary man who was engaged to Mary. And the engagement back then was different than what it is now. Um, back then, there was a lot of mom and dad setting up uh, their son or daughter with someone else, you know, when they're young and kind of set it up or a matchmaker kind of did that. Um, and they, they called it, you know, an engagement and it moved into maybe a betrothal type of thing. And betrothal was binding. It wasn't just this flippant like, well, let's date and we'll see what, what happens. No, this was, this was very set up. This was an arranged type of thing. Um, and from commentaries that I've read, a betrothal typically lasted one year and could only be terminated by a divorce. And if you notice that when you read about Joseph and Mary in Matthew chapter 1, they, they called each other husband and wife, but they weren't technically married yet. And even during the betrothal time, that engagement time, um, they still called each other husband and wife, but they didn't have the rights yet of husband and wife until that time period was up. And so we read about Joseph. He loved Mary. He had character. He was very thoughtful of her. The Bible says he was a righteous man, meaning he followed God and his command. So let's read Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18. Uh, I'm reading from the NIV version. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be a child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be a child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's a cool name, isn't it? It's so powerful, Emmanuel. Verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So think of this. Uh, before they're married, she's pregnant. Imagine what's going through the mind of Joseph at this time. You know, whose baby is it? Why was she unfaithful? Suspicion, anger, hurt, pain? Maybe retalia retaliation, resentment. Um, a lot of things could be going through his mind. I mean, those are things that probably would be going through my mind. That's why I wrote them down. And I'm sure the same for you. You could add some more to it. So, so we have the opportunity to see the full picture. But Joseph didn't. He's in, the, he's in this story. He's, he's been at this arranged marriage from when he was little. And now all of a sudden, the one that he's been waiting for it comes to him and says, I'm pregnant. Now what? Now what do you do? Um, the Bible says that he was a righteous man, meaning that he obeyed God. He followed the ways of the Bible. So it says that he planned to quietly divorce her. So he, in good conscience, couldn't marry Mary, who was thought to be unfaithful. And see, back then, being unfaithful during engagements um, was looked upon as adultery and was cause for death. This is a pretty serious thing. This is 
different in our culture today, isn't it? It's more, um, it happens more often now. Uh, but back then, this is a very serious thing. And so, obviously, it, you can read about it more of the Old Testament law in Deuteronomy chapter 22. But um, Joseph is in quite a predicament, right? Uh, so the Bible says that he was unwilling to submit her to public disgrace. So he chose to quietly divorce her, which was permitted by law. So he plans this out. All right, so his, his world is shattered. His heart is broken, possibly. He's, he, I'm speculating a little bit, but he's, he's hurting. And so the Bible says because he's a righteous man, he decided to quietly divorce her. So he considers all this. He has it planned out. And then the visit from God comes. The angel of the Lord visits him and tells him, basically, um, to, to not divorce her, to not be afraid to take her home to be his wife because what is conceived is from the Holy Spirit. And he is going to be basically the earthly father of uh, God on earth. Um, imagine his thoughts now. You know, if we've ever ha- heard two sides of a story, <laughs> you know, this is one of those moments that Joseph is in. He ha- Joseph has this major decision to make. Does he obey God? Does does he obey him whom he loves and be unselfish in his decision? Or does he follow the laws of the land? And does he disobey God and be selfish and, and, and unloving towards his fiance? And obviously in verse 24 we read that when he woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him. And he showed obedience. And that's, I only have two character points from Joseph. The first one is that, is obedience. Joseph showed so much obedience and even though it was against the norm even though it was against what everybody else expected to happen at this point he obeyed God Uh, see what's normal for our society is what to do what feels right we look out for number one we make sure our needs are met Um, typically um, it's we don't necessarily always consider God and and his plan possibly Um, but the Bible says that Joseph obeyed and nobody would have blamed Joseph, right? I mean, back then, they would have said, your, your fiancé is pregnant. It's law for, lawful for you to divorce her. And he had it in his hand. He could have done it. He, the law was on his side. But think about this. His reputation was at risk. Because if he decides to go with this, um, he's complicit. He's going along with it. He's okay with it. And so it wasn't just about Mary. It was all of a sudden he's in this moment too. He's in this picture. And so there's a lot that he's contemplating that he's going through. Um, Maybe it was going to be viewed that he was the father. All this stuff was going through. And so remember, this marriage had been arranged since they were young. And, And now all of a sudden there's a bump in the road. And so my question to all of us is, is how do we react when there's a bump in the road of a plan that we've been following for most of our life? What happens? How do we react in that? What is, what is, what is going on inside of us when that happens? We're following this plan. This is what I'm supposed to do. And now all of a sudden we hit this major bump. What happens? Uh, when Jamie and I lived up in Spencer, Iowa, back in 2005, we were working at a church there as youth pastor. And... Um, we had purchased a house in um, February, um, and then our son Ethan was born in June, and we get a phone call from a guy named uh, James Weaver from New Hope. And some of you maybe don't realize this, this is the church that I grew up in starting in 1991. How many of you remember me when I was a little pipsqueak? Still am? Okay. All right. <laughs> Um, I remember just over here before I came up to preach one Sunday night, I think it was, over in the, the original building. Some of you remember that, you know, 40 by 80, just oblong looking building. I was sitting next to some friends in the youth group, and I think HK Booyer was there also. And all of a sudden, I get tapped on my shoulder, and a note is handed to me. And it's from my mother, who was like four rows behind. And basically, the note says, you better be quiet or else. And I, re- I remember just like slouching down in my pew, like, oh my goodness. Everybody saw that note go forward. They know what's happened, and I'm in trouble now. So anyway, so uh, back, back to the story. 2005 in Spencer, we had just purchased a house. Things at our church were going well, and, um, and our son was just born. And so life was okay. There wasn't any reason that we were looking to move or to, to leave. And Pastor Weaver calls and, and um, 
ask us to consider coming down. And honestly, in that conversation, I almost told him no, um, because I, had, I was not looking. You know, I wasn't trying to, to hop onto anything different. And um, I, I did what I felt was right, and I said, well, let me pray about it. And those of you who are married, who have had children, um, the, the weeks after um, a child is born, things can be emotional in the house, right? And, and um, so I'm like, man, how do I approach my wife on this one? <laughs> it's not like, I mean, her, her family lived just a few blocks away. So this was like home for her. This is a big deal. And I just presented the facts and said, this is what um, is happened, and we need to pray about it. And, and I don't know if it was like a week later, maybe, or two weeks later, we came back, and, and uh, we're like, all right, so um, you go first. <laughs> Because I wanted her to, I, I wanted her to say what she was feeling first, without my opinion. Because I had sense in my heart, this is what we needed to do, and uh, she had said the same thing, obviously. And so, um, we're here. Um, but I want you to know that just because a plan is going just the way we thought, sometimes when God calls us, or there's a bump in the road, or something changes, that doesn't. You know, we need to be obedient. We need to listen to God and what His plan is. Uh, Joseph, he was obedient. So do we continue to serve someone even when it's uneasy? Do we obey God even when it goes against what's normal? Do we follow God's lead in a situation with with our reputation on the line? This story picks up later on uh, in the life of Joseph. It says, you've stood where Joseph stood, caught between what God says and what makes sense. You've done what he told you to do only to wonder if it was him speaking in the first place, you've stared into a sky blackened with doubt and you've asked what Joseph has asked. You've asked if you're still on the right road. You've asked if you're supposed to turn left when you turn right. And you've asked if there's a plan behind this scheme. Things haven't turned out like you thought they would. Each of us knows what it's like to search the night for light, not outside a stable, but perhaps outside an emergency room or on the gravel road Um, on the roadside, on the manicured grass of a cemetery. We've asked questions. We've questioned God's plan, and we've wondered why God does what he does. The Bethlehem sky is not the first to hear the pleadings of a confused pilgrim. If you're asking what Joseph asked, let me urge you to do what Joseph did, obey. That's what he did. He obeyed. He obeyed when the angel called. He obeyed when Mary explained. He obeyed when God sent. He was obedient to God. He was obedient when the sky was bright. He was obedient when the sky was dark. He didn't let his confusion disrupt his obedience. Let me say that again. He did not let his confusion disrupt his obedience. He didn't know everything, but he did what he knew. He shut down his business, packed up his family, and went to another country. Why? Because that's what God said to do. So what about you? Just like Joseph, you can't see the whole picture. Just like Joseph, your task is to see that Jesus is brought into your part of your world. And just like Joseph, you have a choice to obey or disobey. Because Joseph obeyed, God used him to change the world. Can he do the same with you? God still looks for Joseph's today. Men and women who believe that God is not through with this world. Common people who serve an uncommon God. So will you be that kind of person? Will you serve even when you don't understand? Joseph was obedient. Definitely shines through. Another characteristic of Joseph is one that's a little more hidden. is his gentle and kind spirit. If you notice in... uh, in verse um, 19, it says, Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Who would do that? A, a person of a gentle spirit, of a kind spirit, someone who um, was righteous and followed God. So before the angel visited with him, Joseph was unwilling to publicly humiliate her, to do what most would have done would have just been humiliate her, to throw her out into public and say, this is, she's pregnant, this is what she's done, without considering the facts, because um, it, it was an eye for an eye type of get even, be retaliation type, vengeful type. Um, and just like what Pastor Jeff preached this morning, that would be earthly wisdom, right? That would be uh, a selfish 
wisdom, an earthly wisdom. If you look with me in James chapter three, starting in verse 14 up on your screen, it says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast about it or deny the truth. Verse 15, such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. Listen, the earthly wisdom was to say, uh, throw her out, throw the book at her. But there's something different about Joseph, and I wonder if that's part of the reason why God chose him, why God picked him out, and th- because he had this kind spirit about him. He had this gentle spirit about him that shined beyond what anybody else would have done. In one of my commentaries, it talks about kindness and gentleness, the fruit of the spirit. It says, the Christian who is long-suffering will not avenge himself or wish difficulties on those who oppose him. He will be kind and gentle even with the most offensive, and he, he will sow goodness where others sow evil. Human nature can never do this on its own, and only the Holy Spirit can. Isn't that so true? We need the Holy Spirit filling us up daily because we cannot react the same way uh, in our own strength, can we? We want to get even. Our flesh rises up, but we need the fruit of the Holy Spirit living inside of us, active inside of us, and that comes from daily being filled, continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, so, so Joseph shows uh, a true wisdom, like Pastor Jeff talked about, a heavenly wisdom. And, and so look through in verse 17, now through the lens of Joseph. This stood out to me this morning when Pastor Jeff was preaching. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving. It's considerate. Isn't this Joseph? Submissive. Submissive to the will of God full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. If you'll leave that up there for a little bit, think about this. This is Joseph. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was a righteous man. And, and conventional wisdom would have said, you know, kick her, kick her out, have nothing to do with her. But there's something different about him. And he was showing a kindness and a gentleness that maybe most people would not have. So my question to us tonight is, when we have an opportunity to get even, to have the last word, to repay evil for evil, how do we react? How do we react when our lives are bumped? What comes out? Pastor Weaver preached last week about our words. When our lives are bumped, what comes out? In moments like Joseph, when the opportunity to hurt or to heal is in our power, what do we do? You may find yourself in a situation, a predicament where you don't want to show kindness. You don't want to show gentleness. You don't want to show forgiveness. But can I challenge you and encourage you that the Spirit of God living inside of you wants you to. The Spirit of God is is speaking to your heart to say, offer that, extend that forgiveness. I know they don't deserve it. You know what? Jesus was hanging on a cross and he prayed for those who had just put him there. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And so let that be an encouragement. Let that be a challenge to us that we would walk in a spirit of kindness like Joseph, a spirit of forgiveness, of gentleness like Joseph. So it reminds me of Joseph in the Old Testament. This is one, I love Joseph in the Old Testament. It's one of my favorite stories. Um, Remember what had happened? His brothers had sold him into slavery and, and, started the process of years of hurt and pain and suffering and being wronged when he was walking the right path. All of this had happened. So this monumental story has, is taking place. And now all of a sudden, Joseph finds himself in great power and, and great responsibility. And uh, he's responsible for the food and his brothers are starving, they're hungry, and they come to him. They don't recognize him. Um, and Joseph very easily could have done what conventional wisdom would have done. He could have uh, been selfish and and been about himself and been been vengeful, an eye for an eye type of a thing. But the Bible records that he was the opposite. He showed true wisdom and and he offered forgiveness to his brothers. Did they deserve it? Absolutely not. But he still extended it to them. And think about that story and how it lines up with the story of Jesus. Because he showed forgiveness, the the people affected by that forgiveness from those families of the brothers extended to the life of Jesus and the lineage of Jesus. 
very powerful. And so this story of kindness and gentleness isn't just through Joseph in the, Old, in the New Testament. It extends clear back even to Joseph in the Old Testament. So I challenge you um, to be obedient to what God is calling you to do, just like Joseph. If, even if it doesn't make sense, even if in your spirit all of a sudden it's like, I don't understand, God. I just bought a house, and life is good, and we have a child, and we're not looking anywhere else. But for some reason, I feel like you're calling me to do this. So I need to be obedient. Be obedient. And then offer that gentleness and kindness to that person in your life that it's a little more difficult to give. If the worship team would come forward, we're going to close in, in a time of prayer and worship. So... Let me remind you that we need the Holy Spirit filling us up. And it's very true. We need the Holy Spirit. Listen, in our own power, it's hard to be obedient when all of a sudden there's a bump in the road and we feel like, listen, this isn't what I planned, God. We need the Holy Spirit filling us up, giving us the wisdom that, that we need to follow. But man, we need the, the Holy Spirit and the power and the fruit of the Holy Spirit living in, and coming out of us to show that kind of gentleness to someone. And I don't know where you're at in your situation in life, but, but I sense in my heart that maybe someone here needs to be reminded of this, is that even in your own power, it's hard. And I've been there before, and many other people here have been there before. It's difficult. But thankfully, we have God, and we have the power of God living and active inside of us, helping us out. So my final question to us is this before we sing. What is God asking us to do? And will we be obedient? Will we stick to God's plan even when it takes a turn we didn't expect? When times are difficult, will we bail or will we stay obedient? Will we show gentleness and kindness to those closest to us even in painful circumstances? We need to be continuing filled up with the Holy Spirit. We need the strength and power of God.